Good evening. Welcome to this meeting of the new and old Malden Planning Subcommittee. My name is Councillor Leslie Heap. I'm the chair of this subcommittee. This meeting is being webcast live on the Council's YouTube facility. A recording will be available shortly after the meeting. The agenda is available to view on the Council's website by following the links to Your Council, Democracy and Elections, and Decision Making and Committees. The Planning Subcommittee is made up of councillors from the wards in the new and old Malden neighbourhood. There is a registration scheme for residents and applicants wishing to participate in the planning applications that are considered by this committee. Members of the public who have registered to speak will be invited to come forward to the table in front of the public gallery at the appropriate point. Second, members of the public are reminded that the planning application process is constrained by the need to have regard to current planning policy at national, regional, regional and local levels, as well as other planning material considerations, including case law precedent. The decision-making process is often described as quasi-judicial because local planning authorities have to act reasonably within the bounds of planning law and above considerations, and the above considerations, and are not free to term in planning applications simply because of the weight of public opinion. Please could you ensure that your mobile phones are switched off or in silent mode for the duration of this meeting. I will now introduce the other participation participants in the meeting. Um, so if we could go round, um, starting with uh, Councillor Thorpe, just good evening and introduce yourself to the public. Thank you. Yes, good evening. My name's uh, Councillor Richard Thorpe. I'm um, uh, from the Motspur Park and Old Morton East Ward. Hello, good evening. I'm Elizabeth Park, Old Morton Councillor. Kevin Jones, Democratic Services. Good evening, I'm Barry Lomax, Head of Development Management. Uh, good evening, Claire and everyone. Uh, Councillor Tim Cobbett, Green Lane and St. James Ward. Hello, I'm Councillor Andrew Bolton, uh, Coombe Vale Ward. Thank you. At as this is a planning subcommittee, public participation is limited. There is no public question time at the start of the meeting and members of the public may not speak on planning applications unless they have previously registered to do so. Speakers for planning items would need to have registered to speak by 10 a.m. on Tuesday the 19th of July. Um, can I ask you, Kevin, if there have been any apologies for absence received? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Giles has apologised and Councillor Cobbett is attending as his substitute tonight. Thank you. Members are asked to declare any disposable pecuniary interests or any other registrable or non-registrable interest relevant to items on this agenda. No? Um, the next item three, um, may I sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 2nd of December 2021 as a correct record. Agreed. Agreed? Thank you. We now turn to item four on the agenda, planning application 21 slash 00975 slash full, Firgrove Lodge 33 Motspur Park, New Malden, KT3 6PS, which has been brought to planning subcommittee for determination. It relates to the application for the demolition of detached chalet bungalow and erection of two semi-detached family dwellings with associated parking provisions and cycle and refuge storage facilities. The report can be found on pages A4 to A28 of the agenda pack. I now invite Barry Lomax, Head of Development Management of the Council, for a presentation of the item. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the first and only application this evening is at Firgrove Lodge 33, Motspur Park. You see on either side of the room a presentation on the screen, or the screen, whichever it is. 
easiest for you to view. So the application is for the demolition of the existing detached chalet bungalow and the erection of two semi-detached family dwellings, family dwellings being those with three bedrooms or more. The application includes parking provision of one space per dwelling, and <coughs> cycle and refuse storage facilities. On screen now you see the application site just uh, accessed off uh, Mottsburg Park. You'll see that the site is at an angle to its uh, neighbouring properties. Here we have an aerial photograph showing the site in detail. As you see, the application property has been extended extensively over time, as have neighbouring properties. And here we see an aerial photograph from a 2D position, and then some photographs. So this is a photograph of the front of the existing dwelling. As you, you can see, a historic property, although not statutory listed or not a local building of townscape merit. And then we see a rear view looking back towards the uh, chalet bungalow with number 31 and number 35 either side. On screen now, you just see a very quick outline of the proposed site plan. We should come in to deal with that in more detail in a moment. So the existing property is a one-bed uh, bungalow, uh, according to the plans we have in front of us. As you can see, the bungalow has been extended over time, extending it back into the rear of the site. And then here we see some elevations. The property is about 6.6 .6 metres wide and about 5.2 metres to its ridge. And then we see about 15.6 metres back into the site. So the proposal is for the demolition of the detached chalet bungalow and the erection of two semi-detached family dwellings. There would be one car parking space or off-site car parking space per dwelling. There would be cycle parking and refuse storage facilities. Here we see the proposed floor plans. The property... Uh, would be laid out um, parallel with the, uh, the site. Uh, ground floor accommodation, general living accommodation, uh, lounge, living rooms, uh, moving into a kitchen, uh, dining area. And then as you move up through the property, first floor, uh, two bedrooms, and then accommodation in the roof space. Uh, the property would have a crown roof, uh, albeit with a, a, a pitch either side, and then finishing in a crown. Here we see the elevations, the properties together, the semi-detached taken together would be about 9.7 metres wide and about 8.2 metres to the ridge. The properties step uh, in as you, as you move uh, along the properties, they drop from a, a the single storey element, if maybe I've explained it this way, but the, the single storey element uh, projects further into the site than the two storey element. You'll see on screen... Here, where the two-storey element drops down into a single-storey element on both sides. Here we, on, on site now, see some uh, in, uh, uh, measurements in relation to neighbouring properties. Uh, the neighbouring property, uh, number 31, you see at a ground uh, floor level, there is a projection of about 4.8 metres. At a two-storey level, and above that is about 1.9 metres. So you see that this is where we step down from a a two-storey into a single-storey element. Uh, on screen now, you see an indication of how the area has changed over time uh, with other properties having extended. In particular, the neighbouring property. You see the neighbouring property has extensively extended itself towards the bungalow site. So you see this is the property as it stood. Uh, this plan is from, I think, 1994. The neighbouring property was extended in about 1999, I think, or permission granted thereabout. And you see that property was significantly increased in size towards the bungalow. And then you see other extensions have taken place further down the street, as indicated on screen. On site now, you see a street elevation showing at the top the existing bungalow and at the bottom the proposed dwellings. Now, officers consider that it is without doubt a, a significant change. However, officers consider that the street has the capacity to accommodate a development such as that proposed. The recommendation, Madam Chair, is to permit subject to the conditions set out in the agenda papers and then to delegate to the Assistant Director uh, to make any consequential changes to the conditions in consultation uh, with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Um, right, we have three registered speakers on this item. Um, the applicant didn't give time um, enough to register to speak. So 
I'd first like to invite the objectors, Mr. Nimalan Nira, yeah, uh, Balasur Ramanian, to come forward. Mrs. Nadia Hatcher and Mr. Karthik Subramanian, I hope my pronunciation's okay, uh, to come forward to the table. Um, you're reminded that you have up to a total, that's between you, um, to uh, five minutes to address the subcommittee with your comments. Um, Kevin um, will let you know when you have one remaining minute um, and then your time will be up after that. Press on this or is it automatic? Um, just press the button forward, just when you're... Oh, there isn't, sorry. Okay. When you're ready to speak, just go ahead it and down, Kevin... Can we sorry? just do a dry run, just to double check? No, I don't think you need to do anything. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do I have to be that close to it, or can you still hear me from here? Uh, no, you have to come nearer to the mic, I think. Thanks, but there's no button. Normally you have this little button, but there isn't on that one. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're ready to speak, yeah. go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Further to the written objections already submitted to you by multiple local residents, the areas of concern we'd like to stress now are as follows. Misrepresentation. The 3D visuals are not an accurate representation. They appear to have been manipulated when compared to a scale drawing. The proposed front elevation has been made the property to look far wider than it actually is, so given the impression that it can easily house uh, two properties. The car, this is the 3D visuals, by the way. The car as a reference is, is very deceptive. The three-story uh, three property has been shrunk down so as to appear the same height as 31 side extension, which in turn has been stretched taller. Please note, say, the um, top of the garage for 31 is actually the same height as the first floor window sill of the proposed property. The rear visual um, has removed 31 side extension, which would be permanently in shadow. The reality is the proposed will tower over neighboring properties and adverse, adversely alter the long-established character of the area. We would request a planner to visit the plot and review the neighboring resident um, with neighboring residents prior to any decision being made, uh, you know, reviewing the back gardens and so forth. The application form has also incorrectly stated that parking is, the existing parking is two cars when it's actually three, two on the driveway and one in the garage. Section 25 states three bedrooms lost when it's actually a one bedroom bungalow with a kitchen diner and a lounge. Next is demolition and rebuild. How are the existing property's boundaries considered? The proposed property extends far, uh, in, you know, far beyond the boundaries of neighboring properties, as well as beyond the existing bungalow, which has been extended itself and to be uh, demolished. The proposed building is unsympathetic to the surrounding uh, chalet-style properties. The bay windows aren't angled like a chalet. There's no um, sloping roof like a chalet, and it's terraced in style. Were it to be approved, it would set a bad precedent for future unconventional plans to be brought forward. And it massively distracts from the chalet style that Motson Park is uh, known for. And the area is prone to subsidence. 31 has been already underpinned to a degree, um, distance of 2.7 metres. Any groundworks for the proposed could, could well cause damage to the adjacent properties given the proximity and scale of the proposal. And in terms of the history that was um, mentioned, in terms of local history, Fir Firgrove Lodge is a local landmark which predates all the chalets of Motson Park and dates back to about eight, the 1870s. We have a um, Surrey Comet uh, example and the Ordnance Survey maps when it was a coach house to one of the large properties. So over to Nadia. So privacy and loss of light. Due to the proposed development being three storeys, it will tower over neighbouring properties and the loft windows will overlook them, including the front bedrooms of numbers 30 to 40 on the opposite sides of the road. Given its massive rear projection compared with any other properties in the vicinity, not only will it block out much morning sun for the houses to the west, numbers 25 to 31, cast permanent shadow to both rooms and gardens of numbers 31 and 35, 
It will also block afternoon and evening sun to properties around the bend to the east, numbers 35 to 47. Number 35 will lose privacy in its patio garden conservatory, and we also object to proximity of the development to our boundary. Road safety. Fairgrove Lodge is located on a bend of the road which restricts visibility, particularly for numbers 35, 37 and 39, where access is further restricted by two traffic islands. The you front, have one minute left. The front boundaries between Fairgrove Lodge and numbers 31 and 35 must be kept low and clear for the safety of pedestrians and traffic. We are not imagining these risks. In the past year, three years, numbers 31, 33 and 35 have all had cars lose control and crash into our front gardens. The traffic island outside number 35 is demolished by passing cars most years. Inadequate parking for the proposed development. One space per family home is unrealistic. We have already encountered issues with visitors and tradespeople at Firgrove Lodge parking on the bend, causing difficulties for the neighbours as well as general traffic, including the K5 bus and delivery vehicles which struggle to pass safely. Motspur Park is also used as a route for rail replacement double-decker buses and coaches to the football ground, which would have great difficulty manoeuvring around any parked cars. We really urge the planning committee to visit the site and the neighbouring properties to properly understand these parking and road safety risks, as well as assessing the privacy and light issues mentioned. Um, if I have any time left, can I just say... Your you time is up. <laughs> Bang on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, would you like to just remain in your seats um, for the moment? Um, the applicant didn't register, as I said, in time to speak tonight. Um, so I will go to members of the committee um, if they would like to any, ask any questions of clarification to the objectors. Again, members are reminded you have five minutes to speak. Kevin will let you know when there's one minute remaining and when your time is up. So try and make the questions kind of succinct. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Bolton, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just a, um, a quick question, really. There seems to be a certain amount of uh, dispute as to whether the uh, property there is uh, one bedroom or three bedroom. How, how has this come about? I mean, what, what makes you think it's what you think it is. Well, I've lived there since sort of 1986, so I know what's inside there. Mm. And, you know, the, the lady who lived there prior to us, you know, not prior to us. Can you speak to the mic, please? Because we can't hear you very well. Thank can, you. Can you hear now? Sorry. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've lived there since 86, so I know the uh, layout. I've been in there many a time. So, yeah, it, you know, there's, mm -hmm. in terms of rooms in there, there aren't even, you know, three is the maximum. So I don't know how the rooms lost um, has, has totaled more than the, the rooms that there are. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Anybody else have any questions to the objectors? Councillor Cobbett, thank you. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening. Um, just on the, the issues you were talking about around road safety, uh, and it's an, I'm quite familiar with the road and you know, some of the issues that there's been, but... I mean, obviously, you do have houses all along there and cars come in and out. So it's just trying to get a sense of what is it about the way that this proposal is kind of laid out and designed that you think will mean that it will cause issues when the cars come out of the properties onto the road compared to how that's mitigated okay. in maybe in other properties on the street. Thanks. Uh, can I answer this one? Because I live next door at number 35. So from my point of view on exiting my driveway, I cannot see very far around the road, even with no wall between the two properties. So if there's any sort of boundary, bin storage or planting or anything that blocks my view, I won't even be able to see pedestrians approaching as I exit my drive. I'll have to gingerly nose out and I'm likely to hit oncoming traffic if there is any. So my concern is with only providing one parking space per property, per family property, there'll be visitors, there'll be deliveries, there'll be a, an increase in number of uh, vehicles stopping on the bend. There are no yellow lines, so there isn't anything to stop them stopping there. We have two traffic islands in close proximity in the area. So when they were renovating the bungalow for the current residents to, to live in, there were multiple vans and various times visitors, the owner visiting different cars parked around there. And we all observed that the bus had a difficulty getting around because at that point the bus going towards Motspur Park station 
had to go out at a point where it couldn't see any oncoming traffic. And we were very worried about that becoming a regular issue on that bend of the road, which has already had multiple accidents on it. Yeah, it's a rat run. One there. from last December, where, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of our um, fence got taken out, yours has got my taken out. My house has been, to my front Oh, time. sorry. Um, yeah, so this happened last December. A, a speeding vehicle knocked into the bungalow's wall as well as ours, taking the whole wall out. So if you have more cars pulling out, especially a blind corner, you know, people don't always... Uh, follow road speed and there's there's more chance of accidents mm -hmm. equally when there are parked cars if there's mm -hmm. not enough you know visitor parking should we say because there's only one one space per per dwelling if they're parking on that then that means one one lane that driver then has to go into the oncoming lane if the other side there's a fast okay. car approaching then you now I've seen quite a few sorry I've seen quite a few near misses recently does anybody else have any questions? One minute left. I have one quick question, or perhaps two. Um, if we are minded to approve this, you're only going to have one extra car because there's already a car in the drive. I saw that when I went and looked at the property. So you're, it's an increase of one car only. Um, the other question, um, so that's why I was sort of why you think it's going to create a lot of extra traffic and can I ask um, is it no parking on that road or is it it's free parking along that road is there, are, there are no yellow lines but the bend of the road makes it impractical for people to stop there there's nothing to legally stop them from doing so um, my concern is that two three bedroom properties will mean multiple drivers whereas we've got one bedroom property at the moment so there may only be one more car but in terms of number of people going in and out numbers frequency. of visitors yeah frequency of delivery vans coming and stopping um, removal vans all sorts of things the, the 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 risk increases and they will not have any room to turn and time is up thank you kevin thank you Um, thank you. Um, Barry will now present the material planning, material planning considerations and address, address where necessary any issues raised during the public speaking. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So just a, a few things to come back on. There was reference made to how this might set a precedent for future developments. Now, it is important that each application is dealt with on its own merits, so there wouldn't be a precedent set because, as we say, in planning... Each application is dealt with on its own merits. There was uh, at some point raised about subsidence. Now, subsidence and the uh, foundations or how a property would, would be built, if members were minded to be uh, approving the scheme, uh, would be a matter for the building control regime. They would deal with matters of subsidence and uh, matters of construction. That would be purely within the purview of the regime of building control. Uh, turning now to highway matters. Now, of course, it is of paramount importance to ensure that any development is safe in highway terms. And indeed, the National Planning Policy Framework tells us that we should refuse development if the impact on the highway network is unacceptable or if the residual cumulative impacts are severe. The application has been assessed by the Council's Highway Authority and they are content that the proposal would not cause an unacceptable impact on the highway or the impacts would be severe. They are content that the proposal would be safe, bearing in mind there is an existing vehicular crossover and the number of vehicular movements would not be materially different. I think, Madam Chair, they are the two uh, key, or three key things I wanted to come back on, and of course, happy to respond to any questions you or the committee may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, right, so... I'm now going to move the recommendation um, as set out in page A1 of the agenda, which is to approve subject to conditions. Do I have a seconder for that, please, from members? You just say that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I have a second. Thank you, Councillor Thorpe. Right, now I'm going to open it up for debate um, between um, our, our members um, and members may ask questions of the officers, of, sorry, of the officer in this respect. 
Um, and so just raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Thank you. Councillor Bolton, your hand was up first. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much and thank you uh, for your presentation. One of the things that troubles me most about this um, application is the historic aspect to it. And uh, the planning officer, excuse me, I'm looking at my notes, uh, said that while it's not listed, it's of historic interest. And that was my feeling. I've walked past it and driven past it many, many times and enjoyed seeing it. And uh, I think that's the feeling that a lot of the neighbours have, certainly the objectors. I'll just run through you one or two things that have been said um, from the neighbours. Sad to see it demolished, 150 years old, only bit of history of that era left. Can't believe an iconic bungalow will be knocked down. Been there since at least the 1870s when it was the coach house to Firgrove House, historic landmark, etc. And it seems to me that uh, if we lose a building like that, um, then that's a great shame. Now, it may well be that there aren't uh, sufficient planning grounds based on the particular building itself, given that it's not listed. But I wonder if the applicants might like to think again. Uh, it's been put forward by uh, one of the objectors. I think that perhaps the um, oldest part of the building could be kept and somehow the back of the building could be remodeled quite well and quite tastefully. And there you would have a, a, a better a uh, thing to work with rather than just demolishing a 150-year-old house with some, okay, not necessarily architectural merit, but definitely historical merit. So that, that really is my main point, and I'd perhaps at some point like to um, get uh, Barry Lomax's his view on, on this idea of historic but not protected. Thank you, Barry. If you could come back. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, yes, I, I, I don't um, dilute the point that Councillor Bolt has made. It's a, very, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point well made. But we are in a situation where the property does not carry any designations, and therefore we can't treat it as if it does have those designations, where the hurdle for redevelopment would be much higher. At best, uh, this application could be deemed to be a non-designated heritage asset, and if it were to be deemed to be a non-designated heritage asset, national planning policy framework tells us that we then should arrive at a balanced judgment, taking all of the factors into account. Now, what is important in arriving at that balanced judgment is a number of things. Most importantly, uh, number one, the local authority doesn't have a five-year supply of housing land supply, therefore we are in a tilted balance, and the weight we give to delivery of homes would be substantial. And also, the proposal would deliver a or two three-bedroom family-sized properties at a time when the local authority's housing need is mainly focused in family properties. So again, that would garner significant weight. So I appreciate Councillor Bolton's points, and it, it might be that if permission were granted this evening, the developer might be more willing to look at uh, revisions to the scheme, knowing that they do have something to fall back onto but I would um, urge members to bear into consideration those two very weighty considerations of the five-year housing land supply and the delivery of family homes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Um, Councillor Cobbett, you wish to speak. Oh, thank you, Chair. So, yeah, Councillor Bolton picked up one of the points I was going to ask, but um, I'm probably more on questions for Barry at this stage and then might come back in on debate later. So I suppose the, the other areas beyond the historic point um, that seem to be at stake. I mean, one is around the idea of the overlooking and loss of daylight and sunlight and the, the assessments given in the presentation by the objectors and the way that that's obsessed in the report are quite different. So it's just trying to understand how the report has come to its conclusions and, and just to sort of understand about what's regarded as acceptable in terms of changes to daylight and sunlight from now compared to what it, what it would be. And then there is a, the, then there's the point, I suppose, about the character of the area. So, like the the Mot Motspur Park as a road, and many of the roads off do have a, a fairly consistent sort of style that is what you associate with that area. And again, the assessments from the objectors in the, in the report about whether 
this design would be a break from that or in keeping with it again are quite different so just trying to understand that in terms of the materials and what the what the look and feel would be of the finished article compared to, to what's all already there um, I think are probably the um, other than the point that Councillor Bolton raised and the and the road and the sort of road safety issues those seem to be the other kind of key key issues so just be interested yeah, on how the report has, has reached the conclusions and and what we need to take into account there. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. So with regards to overlooking, now, in an urban context like this, there is intervisibility between gardens. That is just a matter that happens in an urban context. The only uh, issue officers have here is there would be windows on the sides of the, the flank elevations of the dwelling that might provide additional intervisibility which wouldn't necessarily be uh, readily apparent in the area as such there is a condition it is condition number nine that requires those first floor flank windows to be obscurely glazed and fixed shut so as to negate overlooking from those two side windows now with regards to the rear windows the intervisibility between properties is what you would get from other properties down the road looking back into neighboring gardens and given the context of the site, officers consider that whilst there would be an increase, that would be within the, uh, in the, uh, in the bounds of what one would expect in an urban area. With regards to daylight sunlight, uh, the proposal wouldn't impact on the vertical sky component which either properties on either side or further enjoy. They're, they're, the amount of, of daylight the windows see from their rear elevations would remain the same. The only issue would be with regard to overshadowing. Now, given the orientation of the properties on this uh, east-west line, there will always be overshadowing from neighbouring properties onto neighbouring gardens, and that would happen at different levels of severity at different times of the year when the sun obviously is higher in the sky. There would be less overshadowing. There will be overshadowing of, currently, number 31 into the garden of the bungalow, and then of number 35 into its neighbouring garden. Overshadowing is what one would expect to see in an urban area. That would not be right throughout the day. It would be at certain points of the day and more severe at certain times of the year, taking those factors into account and having regard to guidance in the BRE guidance, uh, in particular with regard to daylight and sunlight, officers think that whilst there would be a change, it is not a change that would be significant enough so as to weigh against the proposal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Um, Councillor Park is next, and then Councillor Thorpe. Thank you. Uh, actually, my question is quite similar to Councillor Corbett, because I wanted to ask uh, about uh, how much the privacy can be protected, and also the sunlight will be affected if we build, this building has been built up. So I wanted to ask you the, the many the objection was saying drawings actually it's not accurate and saying height is more than higher than na neighbor and I wanted to know exactly the height you whether you know the neighbor and this building so they can have a very clear idea it's not just uh, just guessing it I, I want I want to know exact height is compared to neighbors. And also, yeah, though you already answered about the sunlight and privacy, that's what I wanted to ask. And also one more thing, so you see, it's kind of a very similar features, so shallow and very historical, the features they have is, so if we build this kind of house, how much are you going to keep original kind of a material and style? And also some of the objections they mentioned about there, there are mature trees in there, then how are you going to protect this one? What are you going to do with the, the, the mature trees in that area? That kind of things I want to ask. Sorry, um, I forgot to mention, would you like to go back and sit in your original seat? Sorry, I forgot to say that before. Thank you. No, that, that bit's finished. I'm sorry, I, I should have asked you to go before. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So looking at, uh, in terms of privacy, uh, I think we have strengthened and protected as much as we can do in the situation by restricting those side windows at first floor to be obscurely glazed and fixed shut. 
uh, below 1.7 metres. But that's your eye line, so below that there would be a, a fixing shut. Now, looking at the design, um, the design is different to that it replaces and, of course, is different. You can see it different from what other styles are. It does borrow elements of the local architectural vernacular, bay windows, but the roofscape is different. Now, whilst there is a, a character, and the character is probably much wider than Mottsma Park, and that is properties with cat slide window or cat slide roofs, uh, they have changed over time. Uh, indeed, the neighbouring property at number 31 has significantly changed with the dormer windows above its garage extension. So there, there is variety. Now, of course, design is a matter that members will have to balance on, and if members were minded that they weren't uh, overly keen on the design, that would weigh against the proposal, and the weight it would be attributed would be a matter for members taking other considerations into account. Now, with regards to the accuracy of the drawings, these have been tested with the applicant. The applicant is, is signs a declaration to say that the drawings are correct, uh, whilst questions have been raised, I have no evidence in front of me that I can share with members that call into question the accuracy of the drawings. I have been on site. I've been on site before I've come here this evening to have a look, and I'm stuck in that horrible traffic at the roundabout before. Uh, it, it, they are, as I see them, accurate drawings. The height of the proposed building would be comparable with the height of number 31, slightly taller than... Let me just, sorry, just me double-check I'm getting my numbering right. Uh, a comparable height to the property on the left-hand side as you view it, which is number 31, and I think it's slightly taller than the property to the right-hand side as you view it, number 35. And with regards to the trees, uh, we have no reason to suggest that this proposal would harm trees in any way. However, if members were minded, they could impose a condition to ask for a survey and tree protection measures to be put in place if, when the development would be built if members were minded to approve. So if there were concerns about the, um, the trees, that could certainly be dealt with by way of condition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Councillor Thorpe. I've, I've sympathy, Councillor Cobb has made the point as well, with the con concerns about traffic in Botsford Park. I've spent many happy hours canvassing there, and it's not an easy place to get up and down. I was very struck with paragraph 11.8 on, on A16, where uh, you, you've set out the, the, the points about crossovers, and I was I, slightly confused about how exactly this will work. You say that the, the new crossover will be subject to a separate application should planning approval be granted. And that the appropriate access, egress, and visibility would, would be an important issue. Can you elaborate on that? I didn't quite understand how that would work. So there will be a further application later in the process, is that right? Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Madam Chair. So there would need to be a separate application for a crossover. So but members would be looking at the crossover here, but that would need to go in front of a different uh, process to be verified with the Council's Highway Department. But, of course, the Council's Highway Officer who would be involved in that highway application for the crossover, has looked to ensure that it is safe. And the, the highways officer is content that it is safe. Now, I am not um, trivialising the concerns of the residents in terms of uh, moving out of, their neighbor, out of their driveways and having good visibility. So, again, if members were concerned, we could certainly impose a condition that could limit or not permit the storage of the refuse in the locations which are currently on the plans, but we could work to move them into what might be a, a, a better place in terms of there being a perception of an impact on uh, visibility, although the highways officer don't think there is, but certainly if that is a concern of the neighbouring properties, that could be picked up by way of condition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Has anybody else got any questions? <clears throat> I have a couple of questions myself. Um, I think I'd like to see active EV charging points if we're minded to approve this for both of the properties, both the new units. I think that would be good, the way things are going forward now. Um, also, um, just the question of how the property is going to be heated. Um, I think possibly... PV panels should be probably erected there on the roof or somewhere. I don't know. I didn't see anything in the document that directed me to that, uh, but I think that is quite important. Um, 
And we've also we've already mentioned the, the crossover, daylight, sunlight. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably it. The, the EV charging point and the photovoltaic panels for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So turning first to the charging infrastructure. Now, whilst planning policy wouldn't uh, require uh, vehicle charging points in the scheme of this uh, magnitude, the building regulations process certainly is speeding in that direction and would require. And I would uh, be content, given that these are two new properties, that the applicant, if he were to be permitted or given permission tonight, uh, would not find it tremendously difficult to include two charging points. So I think that is a matter that you could impose, if so minded, by way of condition, and that was certainly aligned with the way the building regulations movement is going. And with regards to photovoltaic cells, there is a condition requiring 19% um, improvements over the carbon emissions, and I think that that is more than likely to come from photovoltaic cells, but I think maybe um, condition 13 on the agenda could have an informative with it, and that informative could say that we would like the applicant to explore the use of photovoltaic cells or an energy source, air source heat pump or such type of infra uh, infrastructure so as to achieve that 19% reduction in carbon emissions. But by putting it in an informative, it does make it clear, as you spoke about the wish of seeing that type of infrastructure, because, uh, again, where the building regulations is moving to, and given that as a council we have declared a climate emergency, we should be all we could, should be doing all we can to drive down carbon emissions. So electrical charging points could be swept up by an extra condition. Photovoltaic cells, th condition 13 could be amended or uh, am amplified by additional condition, uh, informative rather, Kevin, sorry, I'm making your life rather difficult trying to get all this down. Uh, in extra informative, um, uh, asking for the applicant to explore technologies such as photovoltaic cells and air source heat pumps, heat, air source heat pumps, etc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Um, so just going round on those conditions, um, would members be happy to include those? Should we be minded to approve? That includes the so that would be the two Barry items that yeah. The two items that uh, Barry's just mentioned, the PV panels, the uh, charging point, active charging point. Um, the other thing was Park mentioned, which was the bins and the privacy and that, whether that could be another condition as well. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So certainly the condition about uh, notwithstanding the information submitted, details of the location of the bin stores and boundary treatment shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority, reason being so as to minimise any perception of impact on visibility displays. So that would cover that point. And then Councillor Park did raise concerns about tree impact, and that oh, could yes, be swept up uh, with a condition requiring uh, tree protection measures to be put in place during the construction, if members were minded to approve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Um, does anybody else have any other issues or anything they want to put forward or conditions for that? Or do you want to now go to a vote? Councillor Bolton. Uh, Chair, I, I have one or two other comments if there's still time for me to, to get in. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, I just wanted to say that, uh, of course, I'm grateful to, to Barry for his advice on the possibility of that house being declared at some point a non-designated heritage asset. Um, but I don't see that that house should be demolished just for the provision of two other houses being essentially shoehorned onto a pretty small site. And as we've heard from the residents, great concern about uh, the road situation as well. Um, it seems particularly perverse almost to me um, that, that we would be doing this given that the borough is supposed to be pursuing some sort of heritage-led recovery. And I, I don't see that demolishing a 150-year-old house, or however old it exactly is, really sits well at all with that more general policy. But I do understand that might not be relevant for tonight's meeting, but it just seems rather perverse to me. Would you like to come back on that, Barry? Thanks. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Councillor Bolton make very good uh, points, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with them uh, in general. Just when it comes to planning, there are obviously different planning policies um, uh, associated with it. Now, of course, the demolishing of a property has environmental disbenefits associated with it. There is disbenefits associated with demolition of any property. However, one must weigh that against the building of two modern, high-performing replacement buildings and the energy savings that that would create. So there would be a short-term environmental disbenefit of demolition of an existing bungalow, but then there would be long, medium, long-term environmental benefits in the replacement of high, well, replacement with highly performing buildings. But I, I am sympathetic to the point about the loss of heritage. The problem is it is not a it is not a listed building, it is not in a conservation area, therefore the protection it has is very, very, very much reduced. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barry. Does anybody else have any more comments that they wish to make before we go to a vote? Councillor Coppert. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm just, at the moment, I'm sort of trying to weigh up where I am on it, all factors being considered. Obviously, if we if we reach the point where the majority decision was to approve, then it'd be worth coming back and, and checking that the things we've been concerned about are covered in conditions. But in terms of the, the thinking about the decision about whether to approve it, I mean, I do think it's a, I do think it's a relatively finely balanced one, um, because obviously I understand, in general terms, that all of the issues that we always face around uh, land supply challenges and the need for family homes, and you would get to two three bedroom family homes and the, the homes themselves would be of a of a good and livable standard um set against that there's a num there are a number of things that we've discussed that you could to some extent deal with by condition but would still give me some concern i mean the the historical element is a difficult one to judge because it doesn't have as we've discussed that sort of any sort of statutory legal protection but at the same time it does seem a great shame to kind of avoid uh, to, to lose that link that sort of one remaining link to that period if you don't need to and it sort of it does seem a shame that it's not a scheme that's sort of more more sympathetic to it or you know modernizes what's already there but keeps some of the features but it, it, it's not easy to know how much weight to give to that but it is it is a factor um it does also seem that i mean i think you could there's certainly room on this plot for sort of one larger house or, or two, two small homes, but it, I think some of the issues that have been raised by the objectors are, are there because, as I think Councillor Bolton mentioned, it sort of seems to be almost use, using every inch of the plot, which means, to me, that could ex exacerbate some of the issues around the overshadowing and the road safety. I think it's the road safety bit that I'm probably the most concerned about because... Uh, I have quite a lot of experience of it because I, in my, before the boundaries changed in the last term, I represented this area and there was a lot of resident concern about, about speeding and road safety on Motspur Park and I remember a number of times walking up and down various bits of Motspur Park looking at the road markings and what could be, done, be improved. Now, obviously that doesn't mean that you couldn't have any development here and there are homes down it already so you have to take that into account. But I think the objectors have articulated the point about sort of where it is on the road and it being on a bend and a blind spot in the road. So, I mean, there is, okay, a vehicle comes out at the moment, but you could have, I suppose what worries me is you could have the two spaces and you've got one of the cars already parked and then the other car has got to get past that car sort of into the road to see what's coming. And that could exacerbate the issues that we're already aware of. So that, that, that certainly makes me nervous about it. Um, so as I say, I think it's finally balanced, but I, weighing it up, I think I'm at the moment more inclined to... Um, to reject, but obviously if others come to a different view, then I would come back in at that stage to make sure that we're dealing with the things by condition in, instead and sense check that, but that's where I am at the moment. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Cobbett. Um, Barry, could you just come back, the highways, their comments about the highway situation, just to cover that, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, uh, again, I, I do not want to be seen to be uh, trivialising the highway safety concerns because they are real concerns. They, and they have been addressed by our colleagues, our colleagues in, the, in the highway team. They have no objection 
to access. Now, if members were minded to see that as an objectionable matter, we would need to have evidence of why it is an objectionable matter, given that the technical experts have assessed it and do not see an issue. If we are concerned that we think maybe the finer details of the access arrangements that Councillor Cobbett has alluded to and the laying out of the, of the front areas of each property, that could be captured by way of condition to ensure that the finer details of how that car park arrangement works uh, would be controlled. Uh, you know, we, we need to take everything into account. The, the existing use of the site, the increase or potential increase in movements not being significant, uh, the ability to capture some of these things by conditions, and then, of course, the technical uh, comments from our technical advisers. So uh, I would uh, say, whilst not seeking to trivialise the issue at all, but I think the issue could be swept up by way of conditions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Just really to reinforce that point, I really wouldn't relish reversing out of that space into that road. If I, I'm not a good driver, my wife does the driving, but I wouldn't relish reversing out of there unless I was absolutely clear that I could see both ways, which is why I think it would be really helpful to have a condition on that. Can you just repeat that? Because I didn't really Sorry, hear my, a lot. Sorry, my, my voice is playing up. Sorry, would no, you no, speak, it's, speak it's, a bit so more into that? Yeah, of course. It's, Thank it's, you. The, it's reversing out of a space there. Um, which you're probably going to have to do because it's going to be in and out. At some point, you're going to have to reverse. The visibility is not great down that street, and I think I would be, want to be confident that there was good visibility both ways. So we could, if we had that as a condition, as you've already suggested, Barry, that would give me a lot more confidence. Yeah, I think... Could we do that, Barry? Yeah. I mean, from that road, I went and had a look at the property on Tuesday myself. Now, it was a very hot day, and I think people had gone to ground because it was so hot. But Motspur Park was absolutely empty. That was about half past four, quarter to five. It was empty down there. Not a car in sight. Um, I imagine it's not always like that. I have been down there on previous occasions, and it is quite bit a busy road. But I was a little bit taken aback that there wasn't. But, I mean, I would never reverse onto a road like that myself. Um, but that's just a personal matter. Thank you, Councillor Belt. Yeah, ju just very, very quickly. Um, of course, um, the day the chair is referring to was very hot, and when I went to have a site visit, it was very hot as well. But the issue of, of speeding down Motspur Park has been a long, long-running issue. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I was there, I think it was on Saturday, yes, uh, a couple of cars just driving incredibly fast. So... Uh, sure, it was quiet because of the hot weather, but it, there was a big issue there at Motspur Park, the road. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, it feels as if we're, 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 all, we're all familiar with the road I used to live around the corner, so again, I know how, uh, how busy the road can be at certain times. Now, what I would say is, if there are speeding issues on the road, and there are incidents of speeding, now, of course, there are measures that the council could put in place to address speeding. It's not necessarily the fault of the developer that people are not adhering to the law on the road. So I think we just have to bear in mind that if there are problems, and clearly this has been amplified and discussed here, maybe this should be taken away and we should discuss it with our highway colleagues of how those matters can be addressed. It would be unfair if a developer is put at a disadvantage because of existing issues on the road that aren't a problem of this scheme. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any more comments? Questions? No? Okay, so I'm going to move to a vote. I'm going to have a show of hands. So those in favour of the scheme, please raise your hand. With the, With the amended conditions. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So just to, uh, uh, to, to note, those amended conditions would be the uh, amendments for the layout of the front to prevent the, or oh, sorry, notwithstanding the information submitted, locations of refuse and storage, uh, refuse and recycling storage and boundary treatment shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local authority, the reason being to ensure good visibility up and down Motspur Park. A condition with regards to tree protection measures to be put in place during the construction um, to be, um, to be uh, submitted to and approved in writing by the local authority uh, for the development to be delivered with uh, active electrical charging points for each dwelling 
uh, taking your point, Madam Chair, about the EV charging, and then the additional informative to amplify condition 13 to ask the developer to explore the photovoltaic cells and the air source heat pumps and other similar uh, technologies so as to achieve the 19% reduction in carbon emissions. I think they're the um, conditions that uh, I remember being raised, Madam Chair. Yes. Councillor Corbett. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just so while we're on conditions, I mean, I, I mean, I certainly agree with having, you know, if, if the subcommittee was minded to approve, I certainly agree with having a condition which is around improving the sight lines, the cars coming in and out. But I suppose then the follow-up question to that is if you if you're going to have a condition that say moves where the bin recycling area is, so it doesn't inhibit that, do we know that? Because obviously we've got the plans as they are at the moment. So if, if we were to move that from where it currently is to aid with that issue, is there somewhere else for that to go, as it were, within the space that's available? And then the other one I was going to ask about in terms of possible conditions was, and it, I, this may not be something you can do, but I mean, because one of the other things we were talking about is in terms of the local character and it being sympathetic to what's already there. I mean, is there anything that you can stipulate in terms of sort of materials used that would make it more in, more sympathetic to surrounding properties? Or is that, you know, you've either got to take it or leave it as it is kind of thing? Or is there a, is there a relevant condition that you could have on regards to that? Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, taking the first point, uh, y y yes, I'm, I'm confident there's, there's sufficient space for the refuse and recycling storage to be moved within the site and to have, therefore uh, take it away from that uh, perceived hotspot at the front. Uh, turning uh, then to materials, what we could do, if members were minded, uh, it is quite within uh, reason to put a condition on asking for two things. That would be for the architectural detailing to make sure that the finer details of the properties are such that they respect the historic property they leave behind and then they make a positive contribution themselves to the character. So the architectural detailing of window reveals, overhanging, details of the guttering, that can be secured along with samples of materials or details of materials to be submitted. So we could strengthen those conditions. So, so that would be architectural detailing to be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority, architectural detailing to include details of door reveals, window recesses, overhanging details, architraves, and uh, so on. And then for the... Um, I'm getting... And it's for samples or details of materials to be submitted to and approved in writing. Thank, Thank you. you, Barry. Any further comments? Yes, we're going to vote and include those extra conditions. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. So, um, can I have a show of hands for those who are in favour of this proposal? Three in favour. Three in favour. Those against? And no abstentions. Thank you. I don't have any um, authorised um, late items by the chair, and so I close this meeting at 8.31. Thank you. <laughs>